If you want to pick a pawpaw or even better, a prickly pear, you need to be really careful because prickly pears are prickly. So, and listen very carefully because you will need to know this as a necessity of life. You need to use a claw to pick that pear, okay? Very important. Now, if you want to get a pawpaw from the big pawpaw, Baloo from Jungle Book for those of you not in the know, you wouldn't need to use a claw. You can ask. He's a sweet guy like that, and he'll do all the hard work for you. This has been a Bear Necessity PSA. Before we start, don't forget to check out our Discord, our coffee page, and like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell, all the things. It really helps us out. Wonga Philip Harris, yes, that is his real name, was born in 1904 in the small coal town of Linton, Indiana. Both my mother and father were in show business. Uh, my father was with circuses like Ringling Brothers, South Floto, Hagenbach and Wallace. And I was a kid, I'm an only child, and I was born in a town called Linton, Indiana. That's about halfway between Terre Haute and the University of Indiana, IU. And uh, both my mother and father traveled, and I was raised with my grandfather. And all of a sudden, I, I, I had nothing to do with it. I wanted to play drums. So I whittled out a pair of stakes and used to fool around on the rungs of the chairs and everything. Harris began drumming at the Nicklow Theater in Linton by age nine. So eat your heart out of your heart-shaped box, Dave Grohl, and soon began providing sound effects for its shows. At age 11, his family moved to Nashville. Here, Harris identified himself as more of a Southerner. This became the backbone of his show business identity. As a teen, Harris found employment as the drummer for Francis Craig's orchestra and was the main attraction of the band. While working the nightclubs and gaining a reputation as a good drummer in the area, a booking manager approached him about working in Australia, a country famous for drummers. And this thing. He came over to pick four guys. This is strange. He came over to pick four guys to augment with the Australians because they were tremendous musicians, but they didn't know a thing about jazz. It started in our country, as mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm working one place. Loughner's working another place. Uh, uh, Chuck Mall is working another place, and Remley's working another place, and this guy picks the four of us, going to different places. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything about it. And he went to this booker, and that's the way we happened. And then I went home to Nashville, and then I get a letter or a call saying that Loeffner and Remley and Chuck Mall were starting at uh, Balboa and wanted me to come out and join them. So that's how Loeffner and then the guy wanted me to stand in front of the band because the guy who was playing drums, I wouldn't take his place because he's trying to get through USC. And I said, what the hell? I, I was doing pretty good. I said, I don't want his place. So a guy named Pop Tudor said, well, will you stand in front of the band? I said, I hate those guys. You know, I are one and a two, you know. I mean, it's all the same tempo. Mm -hmm. The only way you're standing out there is if you're good looking, you know. So, but anyway, he talked me into it, and I started singing a couple of songs, and he was actually, I think, responsible for what little success I attained uh, as a band leader. I used to be a lucky bloke. Why, spending money to me was just a joke. But now it seems that I stay broke constantly. And then we went to the St. Francis Hotel in mm -hmm. San Francisco in 29 during the crash. And we spent mm -hmm. 29, 30, and 31. And the only reason that we stayed that long, because I'm telling you something, when that crash came, you had to duck when you walked out the door because some Dago was jumping out the mm. window, you know. <laughs> That's when it really hurt. Throughout the early 30s, the Loeffner Harris St. Francis Hotel Orchestra began recording swing music to positive reception. Play that music, Phil. She never bothered to say hello. She left me high and dry. I got the ribs from the one I love. I got the big go by. Oh, I never thought she could treat me so. Gee, but she made me cry. I got the ribs from the one I love. I got the big go by. 
Unfortunately, the band as it was only lasted three years. Fortunately for Harris, this is because he was ready to move on to greener pastures. Through acquaintances, manager relationships, and good luck, Harris gained the attention of some important people. A man by the name of uh, Frank, who owned the Ambassador Hotel, came to me, and uh, came to me, he came to the manager of the St. Francis, who was a good friend of mine, a fellow by the name of Jimmy McCabe. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, Jimmy McCabe said, you should take this guy to follow Gus Arnheim. That's when they had the rhythm boys, see? Mm -hmm. And the big, they're big again, you know, you're talking about following somebody. So anyway, I left Loughner there, and I went to the Coconut Grove, and Mr. Abe Frank and I put another band together. The only ones I kept was like uh, Remley, who was with his, some other guys. And uh, we went in to follow uh, Gus Arnheim and the Rhythm Boys, and thank God we made it. After a few years, Harris felt negatively about how his career was being managed, wishing for more freedom. He left the Grove and began performing under his own management, this brings us to his next step in fame, dog tricks. I mean, radio. Harris had already been performing on the radio with his band off and on, but his big break in radio came from a chance meeting with his friend Jack Benny. Harris had been offered a gig on a radio show as a band leader, but on his way to California, the deal had gone through. So I came to mm -hmm. California mm -hmm. anyway, back to California. And uh, I'd been here a couple of days and... Uh, uh, Jack Benny heard about it, and he invited me out to Trocadero for dinner. Mm -hmm. So I go out there, and he said, uh, what program are you on this year? And I said, well, I haven't got one. He said, you're with me. That's the way it is. Just happened. like that. I just <clears throat> happened to be sitting mm -hmm. in the right spot at the right time. And I spent 16 or 17 of the most beautiful years of my life with him, a man who was one of a kind. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think everyone would agree with you. Well, that. what the hell, what? he proved that. I'm so glad you got back from Palm Springs. Well, naturally, I mean, I'm going to tell you something. You mean to come in to do your show? Yeah. Well, certainly, you're a very lucky fellow, because for me to come in from that little spa in Rancho Mirage, it takes quite a caper. Oh, you like Palm Springs? Oh, Spring, I'm laid away real fine. And, uh, ooh, cozy as a bear, plenty of time. <laughs> Nice little house, everything is lovely, all the so we've got everything going, and you know, plenty of stuff. And every evening, all of the people come over, all of my friends, and then along about sundown. Can you hear me, Jackson? Oh, <laughs> fortunately, yes. Yeah, we, we make, along about sundown, we make with that fire. Oh, you have a barbecue. Ooh, and that fire is going all night long. <laughs> fire all night long? Yeah. Well, what do you do about charcoal, then? What charcoal? We burn corks. <laughs> He was exactly opposite of what he portrayed. Mm -hmm. In other words, he was very, very generous. And his biggest asset on the air was being tight, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he was uh, exactly opposite. Otherwise, like he came to me one time and he said, Phil, when he used to cue, you know, me drinking and all this, mm -hmm. he said, you keep drinking like that, it won't be funny anymore. <laughs> you understand mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that was the same way. He was identically opposite. He used to come to me maybe every four or five months and say, uh, go to so-and-so and get yourself some more money. I said, look, I'm getting plenty. All I'm saying is, hello, Mary, here comes Rochester, you know. I could phone it then. You know what I mean? He says, go tell him to give you some more money. In 1948, Harris was offered a spinoff show to be broadcast immediately following the Jack Benny show starring opposite himself, his second wife, Alice Faye. This was suitably named the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. Alice, for heaven's sakes, you've been at that writing desk for an hour and a half. What are you doing? Phil, I'm just trying to straighten out the books. I'm more confused than ever this month. Just look at these bills here. They're all addressed to you. Let me see. You spent all this money in all these different places last Saturday night. And it adds up to $119.35. Oh, yeah, honey, I remember that night. That was the night that... You sent me out for some Tutti Frutti ice cream. <laughs> no, no, I still don't understand. Here's a bill from Ciro's for $15. One from Macombo for $25. A bill from Romanoff's for $35. Sam's Place, $10. Harry's Rendezvous, $22.50. Jerry's Hot Spot, $24. <laughs> Joe's Bar and Grill, $17. 
Phil, I sent you out for a pint of Tutti Frutti ice cream and you went to 12 different cocktail bars first. Why? Because I had to work up enough nerve to ask for Tutti Frutti. <laughs> to show you what kind of a man Jack Benny was, mm -hmm. Jack Benny let me do comedy exactly right following him. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what I had going in, what kind of account I had going in. I had the highest rating in the world going in, the best rating. Absolutely. And I'm doing comedy. That's how beautiful. You know, I have two daughters. I mean, I'm doing a different type of, mm -hmm. of comedy, you know, Alice and myself. But I mean, what other guy? And then I'm running through the alley after they go to CBS. <laughs> I'm running through the alley to warm my audience up. Mm -hmm. And he's let me off the first 15. He puts me on the first 15 minutes mm -hmm. so that I can go get out of there and go and, and start my own show. That's a pretty nice guy, isn't it? During this production, Harris met his comedic partner, Elliot Lewis, a wonderful comedian in his own right but one we certainly don't have time for, so may I suggest Wikipedia? Curly, you don't belong in an Air Corps picture. You never liked airplanes, and you're not accustomed to getting up high. What are you talking about? Getting high happens to be my bed. <laughs> I'm talking about flying. Oh, oh. <laughs> so am I. And I'll tell you something else about Elliot Lewis. He is a very astute guy. And he said at the time, and he's lived it out, mm -hmm. that he would never work with anybody after me. And he never did. Yeah, we were like mm -hmm. clockwork. See, he did the Mully guy and two or three things on the Benny show mm -hmm. when I was on that show. And then when we came in, uh, uh, we fit together like a glove. Working two live radio broadcasts in succession wasn't the easiest feat logistically, but the teams made it work. We finally got it down to where uh, um, it was so oiled and so beautiful and so well written mm -hmm. before we went into rehearsal that we used to have a reading, say, like on Saturday afternoon, and then they would make the cuts or whatever it is. Then we'd start Sunday morning at uh, 9 o'clock. We go through a rehearsal, we go back in the room, they cut it, fool with it, fool with it, and uh, we'd go through it again, and uh, then we'd go to lunch, and uh, we'd come back, and uh, the first program would go on at 4, and the second one at 8.30. That's when we, before tape, mm -hmm. before we do it for New York, and then we did it for the coast. Meanwhile, Harris made several appearances in films and on television. In 1933, he appeared in the short film, So This Is Harris, again, very creatively named, which won an Academy Award for Best Live Action Short Subject. Good evening, everyone. This is Phil Harris and his Coconut Grove Orchestra, broadcasting from the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California. And now may we suggest a new number called It Can Happen to You. Can you hear me? <laughs> Love's a funny thing that you can't avoid. Even though you say you can't be annoyed, it happened to me, and it can happen to you. Harris also made two feature films with Jack Benny, Man About Town in 1939, and Buck Benny Rides Again in 1940. What do you have, Mr. Harris? I'll just stick to the corn. You know me. Hello, Phil. Hello, Charlie. What do you know about Jack Benny that Fred Allen ought to know? Why this sudden interest in Benny? Aren't you on the paper anymore? No, I'm Fred Allen's press agent now. Ready with your call to Nevada, Mr. Harris. Thanks. What goes on in Nevada? Look, Charlie, it's Benny's private life that Allen is interested in. Not mine. He followed this with the feature-length film Melody Cruise. He also starred in 1945's I Love a Band Leader with Leslie Brooks. This is where Phil's signature song debut, That's What I Love About the South, written by Andy Razaf. Now every time I pass your door, you act like you don't want me no more. Why don't you shake that head sign? I'll go walking right on by. Go on, on, on and on and on. Honey, when you tell me that you love me, then how come you close your eyes? 
Did I tell you about the place called do I Diddy? It ain't no town and it ain't no city. It's just awful small, but awful pretty. Well, do I Diddy. <laughs> Additionally, he appeared in the 1951 film Wild Blue Yonder, alongside Forrest Tucker and Walter Brennan. And in 1954, he was featured in The High and the Mighty with some dude named John Wayne. Let me tell you something. If we get in any trouble, any serious trouble that the pilot can't handle, you just come to old Led Joseph. I'll be glad to go up there and help him if he needs me. Got it? Got it. <laughs> Around this time, he also recorded two notable songs, Woodman Spare That Tree by George Pope Morris and Henry Russell in 1947, and The Thing, a hit novelty song which hit number one on the U.S. charts in 1950. A big time for novelty songs. Got right up and turned around to running for my life, and then I took it home with me to show it to my wife. But this is what she hollered at me as I walked in the door. Ah! Get out of here with that. And don't come back no more. Ah, get out of here with that. And don't come back no more. During the 60s and 70s, Harris made numerous guest appearances on mostly variety shows, including The Steve Allen Show, The Craft Music Hall, Burke's Law, F Troop, The Hollywood Palace, and The Dean Martin Show. The guy couldn't stop providing the goofs. Now, Mr. Martin. Oh, Mr. Harris. Mr. Martin. Yes, Mr. Harris. Is it true that you do everything yourself? Writing all the stuff you say and rehearsals every day. You must be as busy as a little elf. Oh, Mr. Harris. Yeah, baby. Yeah, Mr. Harris. Who are you coming to? Every word you said is absolutely true. In the studio each day, getting ulcers, getting gray. Oh, that's just awful, Mr. Martin. Oh, that's just silly, Mr. A. Up to this point, Harris was pretty recognizable to the average American. But his next endeavor brought him into infamy, all thanks to the famous out-of-the-box thinking of Walt Disney. When Walt Disney visited a project, he changed the project. And perhaps the most dramatic way in which he changed the project was with Phil Harris. We went through a lot of bears before we got Phil. And uh, none of them seemed to be right. And finally, Walt says, why don't you try Phil Harris? And of course, some of the animators said, Phil Harris in a, in a Rudyard Kipling film? And Walt says, why not? We're going to make our own, our own Jungle Book. And we'll do it our way. You better believe it. <sighs> Once Walt had heard the audition, Walt went bananas. He loved it. It was one of those things that kind of triggered things in Walt and got him excited. Walt cared most about entertainment, and I think it shows in, in how the story was worked out. So when you get to something like The Jungle Book, I mean, it's kind of the farthest extension of this idea because many of the voices, Phil Harris's voice, for example, is instantly recognizable. Who, me? Sure I am. George Sanders is pretty recognizable. I say. <laughs> So here, the characters could be shaped around the voice. Walt actually cast Phil Harris as Baloo because Walt knew him socially. Well, Phil Harris was married to Alice Faye and they used to go to parties. And one day he said, I want him to be Baloo. And, and this was a shocking thing. How could Phil Harris, you know, a, a Dixieland jazz musician, you know, wisecracking guy, the sidekick of Jack Benny, how could he be a, a, a Kipling character? Even Harris himself apparently you know, thought Walt was crazy. Like, what am I going to do? I don't do this. So I got up and I started to read this thing, and I got about half, you know, about two or three lines, and I looked over at Willie Wrightham, and I said, I can't do it. It just doesn't feel natural. You know, it ain't easy learning to be like me. They said, well, Phil, what do you suggest? I don't know what made me say it. I said, well, do you mind if I do it the way, uh, the way I would do it? And they said, go ahead and try it. I said, look, kid, you keep fooling around in here with these animals like right? that monkey will eat you. You know, I mean, you get your roof knocked in. A lot of the things that are in the film are things that Harris came up with. No, the script writers or the story men did not come up with. Harris would have improvised this right on the stage. And the animators suddenly had new life in the project. Ollie Johnson said to me that when Walt decided that Phil Harris was going to do the voice for Baloo and they knew that they had a character that really worked, he said that was the turning point. Oh, 
kindly. Don't you realize that you're a human? I'm not anymore, Baloo. I'm a bear like you. Little buddy, look, listen to me. Come on, come on, Baloo. Now, Mowgli, stop it now. <laughs> now, hold still. I, I want to tell you something. Now, listen to me. What's the matter, old Papa Bear? Look, Mowgli, I've been trying to tell you. I've been trying all morning to tell you. I've got to take you back to the man village. The man village? Now, look, kid, I can explain. But, but and... you said we were partners. Now, believe me, kid, You're I... You're just I, like I... my gold Bagheera. Now, just a minute. That's going too far. We did five songs for Jungle Book, but my favorite, it's got to be, uh, I want to be like you. I just love that. We figured Louis Prima would be the ideal character. And so we went to Las Vegas, played the song for Louis and the boys. They loved it. So we had Louis Prima, Sam Butera and the Witnesses, and then Phil Harris comes in and he does his business. It was just special. Well, I recall the, the day Prima and his band came to the Disney studio to record uh, uh, that uh, wonderful King Louis song, I Want to Be Like You. We had our own recording stages. And so Prima's band was there and uh, it was just a little too wild and crazy for Disney. But boy, we, we heard those tracks and, and they just knocked us out. Uh, Prima uh, recorded uh, the stuff by himself because uh, Phil Harris wasn't able to make that session. Sam Butera did uh, uh, the voice of uh, that Blue was going to do, and Louis Prima had the spot where he goes Scooby Dooby Doo. Uh, I read, but you know he did that that little spot there. Where he goes Scooby Dooby Doo. And then Sam Butera would say, Scooby Dooby Doo, a dee ba da ba da, a dee ba da ba da, a do ba do ba do. We just it was just aping back and forth. And when Phil Harris heard this temporary recording, he said, I don't sing like that. That's none of my words. I don't. I don't do that kind of. So he was <laughs> getting excited. He said, Well, just, just let me hear Louie, and I'll, I'll do my answers. So you heard Scooby Dooby Doo, a re ba naza, hey ba do ba do, wulla la ba zini, wulla but wulla but sibla at do de. It was amazing, and uh, that spontaneity came off onto the soundtrack, came off into the screen, and it was just an amazing sequence. Hey, the zap and rone, how the people like the dat and rone, can you be better to stop a do the day to bomb the boot the day so bones of a bop bop it? Have a do the will a reap banaza, hey, ba do ba do, will a la ba zini, will a but will a but sibla at do de, will a ha 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 ha. Get mad, baby. After Disney's death in 1966, the studio scrambled to put together a movie without the help of their fearless leader. Wooly Reitherman took over and decided not to reinvent the wheel. Instead, he used what he knew worked. Phil Harris worked for Jungle Book. Phil Harris will work for Aristocats. Namely, the star, Thomas O'Malley, the swinging alley cat. Bear to cat. How hard could that be? Oh, well, thank you. And what might your name be? My name is Duchess. Duchess. Beautiful. Love it. And those eyes. Ooh. Why, your eyes are like sapphires sparkling so bright. They make the morning radiant. Light. Moving on to Robin Hood, Phil Harris's immense talent for acting was used once again as Little John, Robin Hood's laid-back best friend. Bear to cat to bear, child's play. Sorry, Johnny. Guess I was thinking about Maid Marian again. I can't help it. I love her, Johnny. Look, why don't you stop mooning and moping around? Just, just marry the girl. Marry her? You don't just walk up to a girl, hand her a bouquet, and say, Hey, remember me? We were kids together. Will you marry me? No. <laughs> it just isn't done that way. Oh, come on, Robbie. Climb the castle walls. Sweep her off her feet. Carry her off in style. <sighs> it's no use, Johnny. I've thought it all out. It just wouldn't work. Besides, what have I got to offer her? Well, for one thing, you can't cook. I'm serious, Johnny. She's a high-born lady of quality. So she's got class. So what? I'm an outlaw, that's what. 
Unfortunately, in my research, I couldn't find many interviews with Harris, and of the ones I did find, the interviews were much more interested in his radio work than his Disney work. Because radio would surely live on forever, and Disney would dwindle to obscurity. Who killed the radio star again? Doesn't matter. That being said, I did find this one snip where he went out of his way to mention Disney and how much the projects meant to him. But the best things that I ever did, we got to close this thing down. Mm -hmm. uh, the best <laughs> thing that I ever did, I think, to me, uh, doing something that I'm proud of, actually proud of, were the things that I did for Disney. Those yes. are, uh -huh. as far as I'm concerned, they had a little talent. The rest of them were, uh, like I say, are pieces of material, like poker club and preaching the mm -hmm. bear and things, smoke that cigarette. I mean, the, the talk things, you know. Uh, uh, the things with, uh, with uh, uh, Disney, uh, they uh, demanded a little talent, mm -hmm. you know. Throughout the 70s and early 1980s, Harris could be found leading a band which often appeared in Las Vegas, often on the same bill with band leader Harry James. In 1989, he reprised his role as Baloo for Disney's Tailspin. Unfortunately, after only a few recording sessions, he was replaced by Ed Gilbert. Harris's final film role was in Rockadoodle, where he voiced Patu the Basset Hound. Bear to cat to bear to dog. Now that takes years of practice. What's your name, little fella? Edmund. Is he gone? Yeah, he's gone, but he'll be back and he won't be alone, the coward. I would have whopped him if I'd have had my shoes tied. But you know something? Tying shoes is harder than dry dog food. What you wearing shoes for? Bunions. I got a load of bunions. And them shoes help my feet. Harris was a benefactor of his birthplace of Linton, Indiana, establishing scholarships in his honor for promising high school students, performing at the high school, and hosting a celebrity golf tournament in his honor every year. Harris and Faye donated most of their show business memorabilia and papers to Linton's public library. In 1995, Phil Harris died of a heart attack at age 91. What can we say about Phil Harris that hasn't already been said? He's kind of like the Patrick Warburton of his time. He had a super recognizable smooth voice, which could be applied to many different media forms, and excelled in animation. But then there are the things that have been said about Phil, like his stunning flair for entertainment, impressive comedic timing, and laid-back personality. Sort of like someone else I know. Look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your stress. Thank you to these people for supporting us on Patreon and Coffee. And if you want to make sure this channel sticks around, you can check out our coffee link in the description. Every bit helps. Thank you for watching this episode of Dizographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it. And if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked below. We hope to see you in another Dizography. <laughs>